board. It is as simple as that. It's like the two two clicks on the tape machine. Um, hello all, hello to everyone who's saying hello. Um, Stuart Green, to Jane Barrett, to... Uh, it's an absolute honour to have you all here, and uh, as indeed it's an honour to have Roger and Jonathan. My name is Ben, I run our, our bookshop in Tring, um, and I do feel slightly cheeky that we managed to sn snuck in and, and steal an interview with Jonathan whilst he's been doing all these big high profile things a little bookshop a little bookshop like ours doing a, an interview feels rather cheeky but Jonathan thank you so much I think independent bookshops are the heart of a nation so I'm more than happy little medium-sized the man very right. glad to do well it said. I'm glad you say that I'm glad you say that and um, Bridget Knight says hello as well. So um, now I'm here just for a moment, just to advise you what to do. I've had some questions. I've actually sent those to Roger. So he's gonna fit those in, anyone who emailed them. There is a Q and A function um, along the bottom of the screen. Use that to send questions to Jonathan. I'm gonna disappear shortly and leave these two to talk about whether it's schooling or supermarkets or even uh, Barbarossa. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's entirely up to you guys. And, and I will then return at sort of half an hour to 40 minutes time and uh, and put as many of those questions to uh, to Jonathan and indeed Roger. You uh, Many of you may not be aware of, John, of Roger's expertise in this subject area as well. So uh, so without further ado, can I hand over to uh, the wonderful Roger Morehouse? Thank you, Ben. Wonderful, yes. Uh, yeah, a great treat tonight to have um, Jonathan Dimbleby. And, um, can I come on say veteran broadcaster? Is that is that allowed? I, you know, when, when when I was about in my late thirties, I was called a whippersnapper, and I once <laughs> went to an interview with the then prime minister. It's a bit earlier than that, and they said they said the, the Daily Telegraph um, leading article at the bottom said it, it is an insult to the office of prime minister to send a whippersnapper to Downing Street. <laughs> About five years later, I was suddenly a veteran broadcaster. There was nothing in between. <laughs> so I'm not the first to say that then. That's good. Um, and of course, now award-winning historian as well. Um, and you've written previously, when certainly on, on World War II, you've written on North Africa, you've written on the Battle of the Atlantic, and now uh, on Barbarossa. There it is, I'm sure. I think Ben held it up, but there it is. Uh, a very sturdy tome, 600 pages, but don't let that put you off. It is a, a brisk read, certainly. Um, the first question one has to ask, I suppose, Jonathan, is um, why Barbarossa? What's, uh, what brought you to that particular subject? Um, not complicated, mm. that decision. Barbarossa itself, very complicated, as you mm. know. Um, the two earlier books that you mentioned both dealt in different ways with the importance of logistics and the competing demands for resources in the Middle East and in uh, and in Britain's case the the problem of the uh, the war at sea the need to destroy the the u-boats to secure the lifeline to Britain whenever I looked at the diplomatic part of that story I kept finding the trail leading me to Moscow because mm -hmm. it is impossible to look at the military battles without understanding or having a sense of the relationships between the principal political protagonists. In this case, um, it's obvious, Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt, Hitler. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought I've got to find out more about this issue of the Soviet Union, because in my upbringing, Soviet Union was the Cold War country. Mm -hmm. It didn't really have much of a past. The war was won and lost following D-Day by the Western allies. And my education at school didn't do anything uh, to relieve me of that assumption. <clears throat> and the more I read, the more I understood, the more it became clear to me that not only was the Soviet Union important, it was absolutely fundamental to the outcome of the Second World War. And more than that, um, Actually, the, the war was won and lost on the Eastern Front. And in Barbarossa, I argue um, that, and I think it, there is a compelling argument, well, I wouldn't make it, would I? Um, that it was won and lost in 1941. The horrors that persisted after that for another three and a half years um, were actually an attritional conflict of huge suffering mm. because Hitler would not give up, but he had no possibility of winning come late 1941. 
And that, of course, meant that even then it is clear that when Stalin was saying we've got to talk about the post-war settlement and Eden at the end of 1941 was recognizing that, there was a sense that you know, the Soviet Union was going to be powerful at the outcome of this war, which even by then was not predetermined because nothing is predetermined until it happens, but was almost a, a, a certain outcome. The, the question was how much would the Soviet Union gain as a result mm -hmm. of the war? What, what sort of stuck out for you from your research and your writing? What was the sort of the main salient message, I suppose, that was that was new to you about this? Because it is a relatively well covered subject. I appreciate you say that when, yeah. you know, in your education, when you were growing up, yeah. it was something that wasn't really talked about. But to be fair, and again, I th I'm sure our listeners would or, or listeners would, would agree. Um, it has been talked about quite a lot in the last sort of 20, 30 years, it, it, particularly it with has, the history boom and sort of popular history and so on. Yeah, um, not so much in popular history. Um, okay. it, it, the, the, it, and if you look at film and if you look at drama and if you look at television and if you look at a great many of the, of the successful popular histories of the Second World War, the focus tends to be, with obvious exceptions, tends to be on the Western Front for perfectly understandable reasons, yeah. because of the, 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 it was our parents, grandparents, um, uh, great uncles, et cetera, who, who, who fought in the war and, and, and saved us from the consequences of a, of, of a, of a Soviet as well as a, as a, 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 a Nazi uh, victory. Yeah. So I think that what what I think really struck me more than anything, I, I was fascinated by you. You've written. I'm going to just say say this in passing. Your Devil's Alliance, that book there, is a completely unrivaled account of the the events that led up to the to the invasion from the uh, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact of August 1939, and it's 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 a peerless work. Uh, Thank you. And I, very and, kind. Well, it's very important. And I, I drew heavily on it, as you know, um, because it is so good. I found myself going, I wanted to understand how yeah. it came about, because some quite a lot of my peers, you know, educated in the same sort of way as I was, sort of the Barbarossa, they didn't really know about it. If you're an historian, if you're enthusiastic about about history and military history, yes, mm. of course, you know something about it. I, I wanted to know how it came about. So I found myself going back and back and back. In fact, I go back, the first 50,000 words um, are from the from 1922, just after Treaty of Versailles. Yeah. Yeah. So, so going back to Rapallo. From the Rapallo Treaty, little, mm -hmm. little watering hole on the edge of the Mediterranean, yeah. um, where um, after a lot of secret negotiation, the uh, Germans and the Soviets had negotiated a treaty which they sprung that Easter weekend of 1922 during the Genoa conference, which Lloyd George had persuaded all the countries of Europe to attend in order to solve the economic problems which had not been resolved in Versailles and were leading yeah. inevitably therefore to greater social, political unrest. You know, that the, the, this was a dislocated continent in the, in the early 20s. And um, this burst on the scene, this deal, the public part of it was a concordat between the, the Germans and the Russians, um, Moscow and Berlin, who had been fighting each other up until 1917 in the First World War. Yeah. And um, the uh, secret protocol of that uh, was uh, not, it was rumored, but no one knew about it. And the protocol allowed the Germans to train mm. and to test vehicles, tanks, panzer tanks in the Soviet Union. In return, the Soviet Union, there was a trade deal. So there, were, you know, there was raw material exchange from the Soviet Union to Germany and there were finished parts to the Soviet Union. But the Soviet generals were allowed to come and participate to an extent in, 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 in the German military academies. So I was just intrigued by that. That was kept going. I yeah. mean, it was it was that there was even Berlin into treaty. Hitler's even into Hitler's time. Right the way through Hitler's time, the yeah. treaty was kept going. Although yeah. they were excoriating about one another in the public prints, mm -hmm. and but Hitler was very careful. Generally, talk about communists, Bolsheviks, and Jews. You may want to talk about that. Didn't actually personally attack Stalin. Yeah. And Pravda, which was the the main source of Soviet propaganda, 
attacked the Germans and did attack Hitler to a degree, but mainly it was, it was as if the, the two ships that were um, uh, Hitler and Stalin, two monstrous sh ships, incidentally, two monsters of history, yeah. were, were doing, were dancing around one another while their, 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 their battle squadrons were attacking, but without hitting them. Yes. And, uh, and the, you, you then reached the point of uh, that persisting, as you said, and you reach the uh, deeply cynical um, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Now that yeah. really fascinated me. And so what I wanted to do, sorry to be a bit long-winded. No, go on. Have to do. I'll, I, I'm, I'll talk about the Nazi Soviet Pact all day. Yeah, <laughs> You're, we, we do have people I hope who are listening as well. <laughs> <laughs> so could I. And that is, and frankly, that is not known about anything like what. No. About, and the whole of the Balkans is not known about. People just yeah. don't know about it. Yeah. Um, but which, which was the the, it was the war was the, the invasion was triggered as a consequence of the, the rivalry in the Balkans. The Again, I mean, that's not. There's so much here, particularly yeah. in that period. There's so much there that is just not part of the standard narrative uh, at all. It doesn't. And even, even a sort of revised narrative that we have, as I said, I think it, you know, it has moved on a lot, the sort of the public understanding and so on. The revised narrative that we now have, which is pretty good, I think, in many respects, but you know, a proper understanding of the Nazi Soviet pact of the triggers that lead to um to the Operation Barbarossa, for example, you know, you said that the rivalry in the Balkans. All of that stuff is really not part of the sort of the, the yeah. general understanding. And it, and it probably it, should because, be. It's because it's very complex. Yeah. And the countries, you know, people, the Balkans, it's easy to say the Balkans are there. Break them down into their countries and then their component parts within the countries. Mm. Um, and, and it gets, you can get very easily bogged. And the strength of your book, if I may say so, is that you don't get bogged because it's very vividly written yeah. and startlingly uh, useful in in its use of uh, brilliant in, in, in its use of actual uh, conversations that took place on the basis of the documents that you uh, unearthed. I feel like you're interviewing me, Jonathan. Oh, right. <laughs> you, can, you, can have, you can you can come back on me and say, Jonathan, your book is an absolute disaster, <laughs> uh, or whatever you like. Luckily, so I do. I can boast to to your listeners because right. I was told it by my editor today. It has actually entered the Sunday Times uh, nonfiction bestseller list. Wonderful. It's only published Congratulations. last day of the week. So I'm quite Wonderful. That's I brilliant. Like That's brilliant. Um, that's uh, the end of my boasting. I hope. My my um, a question here to, to lead us into the, the meat of the subject on, on Barbarossa. Do you, do you think, bearing in mind, we talked a bit about the sort of the background to it, do you think Barbarossa could have been avoided in some way? Or was it inevitable? I think, and there are, there are competing views, I... I think that um, that Hitler's urge, of course, there were a whole lot of strategic considerations of which the Balkans are a, a critical example. I believe that if you go back to Mein Kampf and beyond that, Hitler's urge for to deliver to his people his promise of Lebensraum, it meant going further east mm. than the Ribbentrop, the Molotov-Ribbentrop line. Mm. Uh, I think that his urge to decapitate Bolshevism was very powerful. I think his urge to eliminate from, from the soil of Europe the bacillus of Judaism, either by expulsion or whatever means his henchmen found suitable, were very, very important uh, component parts. Mm. So the timing was always uncertain. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the timing was conditioned by a number of things, which you can go into if you, if, yeah. you, if, if you want to, but the core economic case for going sooner rather than later was that the German economy and its output, it's, it basically was a military economy, was weakening. The Soviet economy, although it was chaotic, and although the Soviet Union had been uh, militarily humiliated, although it won finally in Finland in, in, in December, uh, the, the, the Winter War in Finland in 1990. But that was, a, that was absolute chaos, the Winter War. And that, and that I think, one of, my, one of my sort of side issues or questions here would be, you know, what, what influence did the, did, did the Winter War have on German thinking? Oh, huge. Yeah. It, it, hugely. They, they came, they, having witnessed the incompetence of the Russian high command, which, of course, had been decimated in the purges in any yeah. case. So all, all the best people have been, have been killed or removed and people, no one can make proper decisions. The, the, the level of armaments, level of training was very low, level of equipment was very poor. Um, um, and the Germans read, it, to, to, you know, go back to, to the, to, to the 3940 and onwards, they read into that, as did 
as did the Western powers, yeah, yeah. that, the, that the Germans could go anywhere. They could do what they wanted. Then you, you, you come to, to 1940 and, and, the, and the occupation of Western Europe, and the Germans seemed unassailable. Mm. So, it, it, so Finland was, a, was a sort of uh, used as a, as a litmus test of the incompetence of the Soviet yeah. uh, uh, leadership. Yeah. And um, at the same time, though, I, I think I think you I don't know what you've got. I think you probably have. You, you know the war games that were played mm. were, were, didn't show an easy victory for the for for, for, for the it showed it showed an easy victory for the Germans. Mm. Zukov played a rather that's why Zukov General Zukov who became the, the key kind of point man the man who uh, that Hitler went to uh, sorry Stalin went to in times of trouble. Um, he came out of that very well. But at the same time, they were the, the, because of their ability to be in the Soviet Union, a lot of intelligence was coming out, which was warning, don't, th these people will fight to the death. Yeah. They had the capacity to fight. In my view, they fought not only because it was their soil that they wouldn't want to have, uh, and their homelands and their farms and their the families. It was also, they were, they, you didn't fight for, for, for Stalin. You were shot. I mean, it was yeah. a very ruthless system. Yeah. I mean, to go, to briefly, you know, to talk about Barbarossa, I think um, that reference, that that comparison with the Winter War, there's a fair degree of chaos and incompetence on the Soviet side in '41 as well. Yeah. Um, but what saves them, arguably, is that is that sheer tenacity of the ordinary Red Army soldier. Right? Yeah. You, you, the, the the I mean, if you look at the at, at the invasion itself, which is 22nd of June 1941. The Blitzkrieg was like the European Blitzkrieg to start with, except on a vastly greater scale, three and a half million men, 650 odd thousand horses mm. pulling artillery. I mean, it's a sort of, it's, sort of, it's Ben-Hur written on a vast yeah. scale. It's, it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. But they faced an army of four and a half, four, 4.3, four and a half million Soviet uh, soldiers. That is, in purely military terms, that seems a very odd thing because you, 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 know, you, you haven't got enough relative might. But the Soviet army was arthritic. Mm -hmm. We touched on it, on, on it earlier. Uh, and it, the, the, Stalin was so unready to accept that the, even at the end that the invasion was going to happen. He, he kept denying it. These were just um, individual generals trying to cause problems, trying to provoke the Stalin and the, and the, the Red Army into responding. And you, it, it, you know, they, they destroyed 1,800 planes as a result on the eve of the of the occupation. Still, Stalin wouldn't let them defend. It was the midsummer. People were on leave. They were away training. A lot of the soldiers didn't have arms, but in numbers, they were enormous. Mm. And by the end of 1941, six six months after the invasion, the Germans had lost 800,000 casualties. The Soviets had lost over 4 million casualties, over 4 million. Wow. Think that the Western wow. allies in, in the Second World War um, um, altogether uh, lost, I think, 2 million men. Yeah. You, you, this was yeah. just in the first six months. Yeah. Terrible losses. But the army was the same size mm -hmm. at the end of 1941 as it was at the start. So they'd lost 400, four, four, and, four, four and a half million, but they made them good because they had this huge population. And crucially, no knockout blow had been delivered. <clears throat> no, well, you, you see, you, you reach the, 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 the first, within a month, the, they had advanced more than 300 miles into, into, they were more than halfway towards Moscow yeah. from the Ribbentrop-Molotov line. Yeah. Um, and it looked as though, uh, you know, to outside, it was assumed that they were going to win. Uh, the, the, the Germans were saying in July, you know, three, four weeks later, yeah, it's it, it's all over by the shouting. Yeah. Moscow will be ours. Yeah. Soviet Union will be ours. And you touched on it. They discounted the fact that the Soviet Union would fight and would fight and would fight, and it had a huge number of men. They, they insert, the loss is six hundred at, at Smolensk. Six hundred thousand um, Soviet soldiers were taken prisoner uh, or, or or killed and marched back into a fate actually as bad as the fate on the battlefield, which was to go into the prisoner of war camps. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 the, you know, of those who went into the prisoner of war camps, um, one in three died from starvation yeah. 
or from killings of one kind yeah. or another. I think in many cases, those aren't even, you couldn't even justify them as, as prisoner war camps. In many cases, they're sort of open, corralled areas where, they were, where they're simply left to die, right? Yeah, they were, they, they were caged areas, yeah. no facilities, yeah. um, a tiny amount of food, total violation of the rules of, of warfare. Really? But they, yeah. in, this, in this conflict, the rules of warfare meant nothing. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was barbarism of the yeah. most kind. It was... It was deformed by the absence of humanity yeah. on, uh, on both can, sides but to differing degrees and in different proportions and for different reasons can you just sketch that the nature i mean this is an interesting point i think a lot of um uh, should we say sort of casual readers of of wartime history might not appreciate fully is that the radical difference between the eastern mode of warfare and and what's experienced in the west uh, because they are hugely different. Can you just sketch uh, uh, sketch what yeah. warfare was like on the Eastern Front? In, in the in, in in the West, on the whole, and it's partly because the the Germans regarded the uh, the Western fighters as human beings rather than subhuman. Mm. Um, there were, to a greater or lesser extent, with a few exceptions, um, and leave aside Japan, of course. Uh, it was the, the it was fought according to rules. You took prisoners and you looked after prisoners. You may have put them into Colditz concentration camp or whatever it may be, but they, you took prisoners. Mm. The the German high command, as well as the ordinary soldiers, um, were indifferent, with a few exceptions, were indifferent to what happened to the those who had been taken prisoner. Uh, those who uh, were caught on the battlefield, there were orders, as one of them was the commissar order. Mm. If, you, if, if you caught, captured uh, Soviet soldiers on the suspicion that they might be commissars or associating with commissars, you could shoot them. Mm. Now that rapidly expanded. And if there was a, a, a group of... Uh, I'll give you an example. Can I, I've actually got yeah, can I read you a tiny bit here. Yeah. This is what commonly happened um, because some of the German soldiers really loathed what was happening, but they were a minority. The letters, which are, are used in the book quite extensively, you have, you have soldiers writing loving letters to their spouses, to their children. I will be home for Christmas because they believed yeah. that they would be, and I long to be back with you and cuddling my daughters. It's a sweet, touching from infantry, infantrymen at the front. In the same letters, they would be talking about how they managed to exterminate some subhuman Slavs. Yeah. yeah. In the same letter. And here's, and this is the kind of thing that happened on a on a mammoth scale. There are there are there are hundreds of examples of, of what I'm about to to, to, to read from um, a man called Robert Rupp, who who was a, a, a German officer, young German officer, who was a who who they were going through the Soviet steppe. And um, in the villages, there were often partisans who may or may not have been being given information by the villagers and vice versa. And the soldiers, the German soldiers in small groups got killed as a result, shot. Um, so this, in this case, his regiment enters the village and, and he heard a command erupted. I heard sounds of gunshot and children screaming. I realized that we were about to commit a massacre the villagers huddled in their cottages then. The troops went through, set light to all the cottages, thatched roofs of the 50 or so cottages, very, very modest, modest dwellings, of impoverished people. Um, and then he, he says they caught light. We heard, I'm quoting him again, we, this, we heard the terrible roaring of cattle, the shrieks of women and children, and then the cries faded away. We drove off from the village and behind us the sky was glowing red. There was, they were dealing with people who did not count as human beings. Yeah. They were just vermin and in the way. Yeah. Conversely, and in reaction to that, um, the, 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 on a smaller scale, Soviet soldiers behaved in ways that were uh, unbelievably uh, horrific. Mm -hmm. um, here's Boris Borompkin, who was a rifleman serving in a regiment, a Red Army regiment. He said, once towards the end of October, the enemy pushed us out of the village we were holding. You see, the war, you'll understand, the war wasn't like, it was a thousand kilometer front, mm. but it wasn't happening like two, like a football match, as it were, two sides meeting each other. It was, it was interlocked, it was interwoven. Mm. There were great 
areas where no one was, or there was a no man's land, and then it could be occupied and reoccupied. Anyway, they took back the village and, um, and they, 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 we regrouped, took the village back. We seized five of the German soldiers and literally ripped them apart with our bare hands, our teeth, anything. One man was even using a table leg to smash a skull in. We killed those men, this is the telling thing. We killed those men in a frenzy of hatred. And the, the hatreds on both sides. That's what makes a fundamentally difference, uh, not only in scale yeah. of dying, but in quality horror of dying on the on the east. Absolutely. Front. Another another point to mention here as well is that you know the Soviets are themselves no angels. I mean, this is a hideous oh. totalitarian regime. Uh, to be fair, as well as um, you know, as well as any, uh, if you like, spur of the moment, passion of battle, atrocities like you just mentioned. Um, the, the 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 Red Army is very good at brutalizing its own men. I mean, to ah, mention is, the I, I, battalions which are set I, up. I, I, I write about <clears> that quite extensively. It was a brutal, brutal force. Mm. Um, they 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 developed Stalin's orders. They developed blocking detachments. So behind and these were full blocking detachments, armed, and their task was if the uh, the soldiers unauthorized began to fall back, they would be shot down. And they were shot down in large numbers. By their own if, side. If, by their own side. If a soldier was captured, he was regarded as a traitor. Mm. His family was denied um, pension rights, his pension rights. Yeah. Um, sometimes the, the children couldn't go to school. Yeah. You know, this was, this, was, this was political thuggery of the highest Absolutely. order. And, and they, and they carried it. Very, they it carried was very it through, effective. Sorry. Yeah, I say they carried it through as well. I mean, those. Oh yeah. Those. If you were a, if you were a Soviet um, forced labor, I mean, POWs didn't tend to survive the war. But if you were uh. lucky enough to do so, or a forced labor laborer, and you are liberated by the Red Army in 1945 from wherever you are, um, you would be, you know, welcoming them with open arms, and they would es essentially arrest you. And you'd yeah. be sent home it, to a camp. Well, you were well, of course, and in that period too, from 19, once once the Soviet Army, I don't, this isn't part of this book, as it were, no, but sure. it's an important yeah. fact. As yeah. as the as the Soviets advanced westwards again, their suspicion was so deep, and they wanted to get rid of the nationality. So the Tatars in Crimea and, and in yeah. Ukraine, they 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 they, they frog marched them out of those territories. Yeah. Now, yeah. You are dealing with two two uh, horrific totalitarian states, very different in their, or I mean, people were more, in, in truth, the, the army high command, for the most part on the German side, um, he would sack them, and that, this went on more and more, the more, the more um, uh, he interfered in the detailed running of the war, the more he got rid of generals if they didn't, if they didn't deliver the impossible for him. Stalin, um, they lived in mortal terror of Stalin's yeah. disapproval, even Zhukov, who's this great big figure of the war, lived in mortal terror that he might incur Stalin's uh, uh, displeasure and be put up before some phony uh, 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 troika of, of, yeah. of judges and sentenced to death. Yeah. And you know, th th this sentencing to death happened a huge amount, senior generals yeah. as well as as well as more junior figures. Yes, and they're, they're, the, the, the great um, um, the great Soviet German Russian um, um, uh, reporter of that war, the greatest Soviet novelist of that conflict, Vasily Grossman, uh, Life and Fate and Stalingrad actually came first. If you haven't read those, you're missing out on fundamentally extraordinary novels of absolutely Tolstoyan quality and character. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he describes the uh, situation where he witnesses, he somehow he gets away with it in his notebooks, which were, which were subsequently uh, um, uh, published by Anthony Beaver and a Soviet Russian colleague yeah. um, or edited. And- uh, It's a great book actually. It's, a, it's an astonishing book. I, I, I cite that quite a bit in there because yeah. it's so vivid. He wrote things in those notebooks. He could never, if, if they got hold of those notebooks, yeah. it would have been the Lubyanka for him, yeah. you know? Very brave man. Yeah. Now we know um, that Barbarossa essentially failed. So the Germans failed to take Moscow at the end of, um, uh, 1941. Um, it is brutal and bloody and they advance a long way and it's, you know, the, the, the 
the greatest, uh, as in the largest military engagement in history as a result. Um, but of course, it fails in its in its own uh, objectives of knocking the Soviets out. Moscow doesn't fall. Stalin stays put. Um, and we lead on into four years of attritional warfare, as you suggest. Just to look at your analysis of why that fails. Um, there are various sort of suggestions often put forward that, you know, for example, that the Balkan diversion that Hitler was forced to make in, in Easter of uh, 41 fatally delays Barbarossa, or that the weather intervenes in such a sort of catastrophic way that it does both, both the wet in November, the Rasputitsa, and then uh, the extreme cold outside Moscow, both of which, you know, are undeniable. Um, but do you see in in those two aspects the roots of the failure or is it something deeper than that it's something it's something it both if you take the, the weather it it, it 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 revealed if you like and exacerbated a problem that they faced in any case it wasn't the after the war the Wehrmacht command always liked to say oh is the weather that yeah. did it just as they denied any involvement in the in the uh, atrocities, which we haven't yeah. touched on, of the of the killing of Jews, um, yeah. but they were because it exculpates themselves, right? Ah, so, yeah. yeah, it was the weather that did it. You know, the weather yeah. was the one certainty, incidentally, and the one thing that could have been planned for, which they didn't yeah. plan for, because That's they assumed true. they were going to get there earlier in any case. The delay I used to, when I first started, I thought this delay was absolutely critical, uh, but and I'd come across it quite early because the delay was caused, in effect, or in large measure by the British yeah. because of the anxiety that the British were going to come in through Greece and yeah. through what Churchill Brit later called the British meddling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and, the, and the British were terrified. The one of the reasons why the British went into Greece was because they were also, one of the reasons was that they were alarmed at the prospect, which was indeed, although they didn't know it in the mind of the, of the German high command, that they might go down south, pincer movement in the Middle East to corral uh, the British in the Middle East and also to go down to India. Yeah. So th that that was that he had to divert, Hitler had to divert in order to destroy Belgrade, which he did, yeah. you know, yeah. smithereens, um, and then to go down into Greece. He diverted a very large number of divisions and uh, uh, Luftwaffe. And, the, and that did delay by about three weeks, the start of the invasion. It was going to be in May, it was delayed until June, mm -hmm. which meant of course, but I don't think that was the cause of it. I think that was, I don't think it would have been done in any case, because I think what we've touched on already, the scale of the Soviet armed forces mm -hmm. and their ability to take punishment in a way that it's inconceivable that any other, that certainly the democratic country would have taken. Yeah. Um, their weaponry was improving. Their output of weaponry was accelerating while the relative decline of the German weaponry combined with the economic uh, challenges that Germany faced, which we touched on earlier on, they had to go because the economy was sliding, yeah. um, meant, I, I believe, those factors meant that it would have happened in any case. Yeah. I mean, it's very difficult to, to say how or, like you found, the, the what-ifs are always fascinating, but yeah. um, they, 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 the speculative mind loves what-ifs. I enjoy what-ifs, but I, I always have to shy away from, you know, pe people have asked me, you know, well, let us suppose that Hitler and Stalin had done a deal uh, when it was clear that Hitler was losing. What would have happened then? Very fascinating question, rather horrifying thought. Yeah. I mean, another sort of a what, what if, but is there a scenario, in your opinion, uh, in which Germany could have succeeded? I and mean, I'm thinking particularly with Barbarossa, I mean, I'm thinking particularly of um, trying to harness, for example, sort of anti-Soviet sentiment in the Ukraine. I know that that means um, essentially the, the Third Reich denying itself what it was, which was a racist enterprise. Um, but th there was a wellspring of, of anti-Stalin and anti-Soviet and anti-Moscow sentiment in Ukraine, for example, that right. the Germans yeah. could have benefited from. Um, and they and they essentially rounded everyone up and shot them, and they they completely squandered whatever possibility there was. Do you do you see that as a scenario? It, it, it's very it, it's important this in, in in two ways. One is there's no doubt that Stalin. It, 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 this was a this was a a, a very secretive state. Hmm. The only way in which the, the dictators you know, understood what people were thinking in in the Soviet Union was through the NKVD. 
through the secret police. They didn't, they, there was no open discussion. They, they, people terrified of saying what they thought. Yeah. But there were, in, in the Ukraine, there were very large numbers of people who welcomed yeah. the invasion, as, you, as you've implied. And even in October, when there was this great panic in Moscow, there were people saying to one another, well, you know, the, the Germans have taken Kiev. They're a cultural, artistic race. We ought to, we ought to welcome them here as well. And at the same time, there was an outburst of anti-Jewish sentiment, which was very strong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these things that the, that the, that the, that the even po the post-war, you know, is not something that the Soviet Union would ever talk about. But um, I, th I think that the, 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 on the ground, some Germans were smart enough to make use of that uh, feeling among the Ukrainians. And they had quite good relations sometimes with the Ukrainians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that it, 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 you, you touched on it. It, the, the what if of that was let us assume for the purposes of argument they wanted Ukraine to be a to be a, 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 a just join the Third Reich. They didn't want that. It was to be a, it was to be part. I mean the south the south of um, Ukraine and into in Crimea was to be a playground. It was to, it was to yeah. be the equivalent of of the Mediterranean for the Westerners. It all open. It's all described in his in his after dinner conversations. They're quite extraordinary. Yeah. And and there were there were there were plans. There was a plan to the hunger plan in order to make clear this space um, absolutely in advance on paper done by economists who didn't actually have a very strong ideological commitment just said this is what is required in order to to free up the food supplies of, from the breadbasket of the ukraine um 30 30 million soviet citizens will die yeah 30 million yeah. that was the plan never happened of course because in the end they lost I mean, yeah. millions did 28 million soviet citizens died in the second world war yeah, yeah. um at least so so i don't think it would have been uh, possible it was incompatible with what H hitler wanted and therefore it wouldn't have been possible had yeah. hitler not been hitler well he would never have got there in any case exactly that's that's always that's always my answer to that uh, that same question i've been asked that same question jonathan and i said the same thing yes you're right but you know um had the nazis not been the nazis then they wouldn't have been there in the first place life would right. have been rather better yes exactly yeah um you say at the end of the book i th i think i'm i quote you i know i read it somewhere um, you talk about Barbarossa in effect as a, I think the phrase is a sort of a foolish gamble or something similar to that. Um, but my, my take on Hitler, and it's not just mine, is that he was always a gambler. He was an inveterate yeah. gambler. Uh, he gambled in, you know, in retaking the Rhineland against the, against the um, advice of his generals. He gambled with Austria in 38. He gambled with Poland in 39. Uh, he gambled uh, in, in France in 1940 yeah, and all absolutely. the time, you know, supposedly wiser heads were telling him, oh, are you sure about this? Uh, and then, of course, he gambles again. I mean, that's the problem with gamblers, of course. The stakes get ever higher and they keep uh, rolling the dice. You now, asked, that's you asked, what Hitler's you, doing, right? I don't need to add anything. OK, <laughs> uh, this was <laughs> you said it the, the, this this was the gamble didn't come off. This is yeah. the, the most yeah. foolish. And actually, it was the most obvious uh, one not to take. Yeah. You know, to, get, to, to go to advance into a country on a thousand mile front saying we're going to destroy uh, uh, Leningrad, um, we're going to take the whole of the Ukraine, the Donetsk Valley, its industrial resources, the whole of its country, we'll go down into Crimea, we'll have the, we'll, we're, to secure our interests there, we'll have the Baku oil wells, and we'll at the same time destroy Moscow, uh, yeah. or at least take Moscow. You know, Napoleon was rather wiser. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I suppose in a way, my where I'm coming from is in a sense looking at it from Hitler's perspective to make, I, you know, I'm not trying to rehabilitate Hitler and that would be ridiculous. But when you see how, you know, he, he uh, if his forces defeat Poland in five weeks, they defeat the Western powers um, who, who uh, you know, the German military establishment properly feared uh, in six weeks. Um, he's basically rolling the dice each time and every time it comes up trumps, yeah, but, but, every but, time that, that, and then, that's true. That's but true. then you, you, then you look at you look at um at um barbarossa in 41 he's already got you know evidence that the red army is not what it should be from the finnish war of, of 39 40 um he's got a, a soviet union that is increasingly meddling as he sees it meddling in his affairs why would he not try for that knockout blow well as somebody really said who was terrified of this because he'd been fighting a war on two fronts which is the one thing they'd advised against and also he'd be far 
longer away from his, his supply lines, getting longer and longer. And it was a doddle in, in military terms, Poland, however fiercely, briefly the Polish resisted. The, the French uh, offered no resistance. The British offered a little, but retreated because they knew the game was up and go back to Dunkirk. Um, and and th that humiliation, a heroic humiliation, if you like, because of the little ships and all of that, but we have our romances. Reality was, it was a humiliation. And the, the, um, he'd had it, relatively speaking, easy. The, yeah. the, you're I was spot on, the, of course you are. The generals, the generals thought that the, and it was a huge gamble to send the panzers in as if the panzers could do it all by themselves in Western Europe. You know, there was no, there were, the, the infantry were left long way behind. It was a panzer operation. And, and it was as if the whole of the world was mesmerized by Hitler. You know, there was the rabbit in the lights in Hitler's life. And, and by that point, after that, uh, by 1940, um, he was unassailable in Germany, totally unassailable. You know, his, his writ ruled that people would disagree with him and they did. There was ferocious arguments during Barbarossa um, uh, uh, you know, part of the delay, which we haven't touched on in August, was but when Hitler had realized you couldn't do all three at once, mm. um, it was wrestling in his own mind strategically with taking the land first in the south, mm. the valuable territory in Ukraine and, and, and Kiev and beyond, or decapitating Moscow. Mm. The generals wanted to decapitate Moscow. He couldn't make up his mind. The result was a ferocious degree of incompetence. I mean, there was, there was, there were, there, if the Russians were incompetent, the Germans were extraordinarily incompetent once they didn't know what they were doing, where they were going to go with their panzers. Mm -hmm. Good point. Now we've got Ben's waiting in the wings. Can I just, just one last point before we, we go to sort of questions from the audience. Um, it's a, it's a slightly personal one, so forgive me, but um, it's a referencing your, your father, Richard Dimbleby. Um, who was, of course, one of the great BBC war correspondents of, of World War II. And uh, I suppose most famously um, did that reportage from the liberation of Belson, which is still uh, horrific uh, to listen to and tremendously moving. Um, but I wonder how much that sort of influences you, how, how that, in a sense, makes this a, a sort of personal thing for you. Is it, is, it, does that play into this or are you still able to... <laughs> To be a, a you know a perfectly objective uh, historian. Well, I, I I hope that the, the two are not incompatible. Um, no, no, in, not in, at all. In, in the in the first in in the first case, um, you're right. Yes, and but it it arose. I I had written the biography of my father, and I was aware of what he had done in the, in the, in the war and where he'd been in the Middle East to start with until mm -hmm. just before um, Al Alamein. Um, and he was then with Bomber Command, and then he was uh, with the with the second army and he was uh, you know in went right through germany right through as you say the the the, 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 the horror of belsen bergen and then um bergen belsen and then on to on to when he, and he was in hitler's bunker so he had that war and i was very aware of that although he never spoke about it um to me. i was going to ask i mean he died relatively young i know but, but did, did you ever did you ever discuss any of that he as a young man not one never did never went See, i was i was a I was a you know difficult late developing teenager and and I was 21 when he died so we never did I, and it's one of the things I now deeply mm -hmm. you know you know how you, I mean again you, things it can't happen but I I always thought I'd love to talk to him with yeah, the, my present understanding yeah. and I did actually think uh, he he certainly he he believed that the war was fought um, uh, to and that's why he was passionate about order. And democracy, and the rule of rule of law, and the freedoms of of uh, um, and the institutions of Britain, he cared about for, because he came from that deep sense of what might have been. Mm. And I have wondered what he would think of my take, as it were, that the Soviet Union beat Hitler principally, and we played a subordinate role. I don't know, but in in um, nineteen forty two. Um, in, in, sorry, in, 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 the, in the Middle East, it was 1941, 1942, um, is my, my editor, my wonderful editor for whom, who's overseen my three books, um, said, your, your father discovered it. I think he was in the Imperial War Museum and heard a bit of a broadcast. And he said, your father was in the Middle East, wasn't he? Why didn't you write about it? Mm -hmm. So actually what I did then, because I, I had written several books before that, which had an historical element. None of them were war history. 
Um, and I wasn't a military historian. I'm still not, I mean, I am a military historian because that's the slot I'm put in. Basically, I mean, rather like you, actually, you're not a military historian. You understand the history of war and that's yeah. a different thing. And that's what yeah. is fascinating to me. Anyway, um, it, and so I thought, shall I, shan't I? And I consulted one or two friends who were already uh, very prominent historians. I said, um, well, shall I do this? You know, I, 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 I can write my books, I can do my broadcasting, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and they said, yes, do it e in a different ways. They each said, do it. You will find there's always something to say, as mm -hmm. you know. And, and then I sort of thought, well, you know, first of all, I thought it was like Lego history. <laughs> and now I see it much more as a, as a jigsaw puzzle, which you try to yeah. put forward pieces, but you're devising, you are stamping your own jigsaw puzzle on, his, yes. on the past. And, yes. it, and you're coming and looking at it afresh, you hope. Yeah. And then other people are going to comment on that and they're going to disagree because you are creating the past. The past, you can't, there isn't, a, there isn't an identifiable map of the past. There's some known facts, a lot that's unknown and a lot that's controversial. Mm. And it's just, so it's, it's the, what is riveting about it that keeps me at it and um and this sounds terribly portentous i really think it's important as well i agree on that and that's that's a perfect note on which to, to hand over uh, to ben and some questions i didn't get your questions done ben i'm very sorry so i'm afraid you're going to have to do it no 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 we can I, do I, it together. I, i'm inundated with so many questions i'm Excellent. actually um is wondering where to go um now there's a couple of um uh, questioners have, have, have moved on finland so i might start with that uh, Anna Banerjee, uh, would Barbarossa not have occurred if Stalin had been, had, had seemed to be successful in the war against Finland? Phew. Um, uh, no, I think it would still have occurred um, because Stalin did not, uh, sorry, Hitler, it, it, it accelerated the view that the, that the reinforced the view that the, the, the Soviet army was incompetent. But I think he was a, a driven man and I think he would have, Done it, and it was just sort of supportive evidence. I don't think it was uh, uh, conclusive evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Dan Store touches on that as well. I'm jumping ahead, but the map in the book implies that Finland, Finland was a full Axis partner while Finland fought a defensive battle against the Soviet Union. How much support and cord was there between Finland and Germany? Oh, there was quite a lot um, in the in the in 1941. Um, when they, what happened first of all was that the Germans got access to Finland quite, and the, the Finns, for natural, for good reason, thought we better have the Germans here and they're giving them some access. This was during um, Ribbentrop Molotov Ribbentrop Pact time, um, because you know we've been invaded, we've had to surrender a bit of territory around uh, um, uh, Leningrad, so we can we can let them in. Then when the war started, they cooperated pretty closely because they, they, the, the Finns drove on, on, Len, on Leningrad from the northern isthmus down through that path along while the, while the army group north under Lieb was coming from a slightly more southerly action. So they, they, co they cooperated fully. Um, I don't think there was ever a, and then of course, as you know, it was by the time you get to 1944, um, Finland uh, uh, no longer, Finland swaps back again and tries to become neutral between the two, and, the, and that comes now. If I, if I just just a point Please. of clarification on Finland, I mean the the Winter War for all of our listeners here is a, an absolutely amazing story. I touch on it in my book Devil's Alliance. It is an incredible story, which is well worth picking up, you know, oh, a yes. book on because it, it's just brilliant. Uh, it doesn't you have to be mine; it. it can be another one. Um, you can do your next book there. Yeah, if I it's yes, quite it's, idea. it's a quite um, extraordinary story. Sorry, you're going... it's extraordinary. But I say on in, in question of Finland in forty one, is that the Finns they do ally themselves with Hitler, but crucially, I mean Mannerheim, who's the commander in chief of the Finnish forces, and and Finnish president, I think as well. But he is a, a terribly canny politician, tremendously canny politician, probably the canniest of any of the leaders of 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 of, uh, of World War Two. And he actually limits Finnish participation in that, in that Northern Front, essentially only to the land that the Finns had lost in 1939-40 uh, in to the Soviets. So the, the Germans are always saying, come on, come on, hit, hit Leningrad harder from the North. And they say, no, we're fine here, thanks. You know, they just kind of advanced to the line that they but, were that, that, But that, that, that rapidly moved into Hitler saying in September 41, we're not going to we're not going to raise Leningrad after all. We'll just yeah, encircle Leningrad. It, fin, yeah. The Finns are important yeah. in that. But what you, I, uh, um, 
Mannheim is absolutely riveting. Of course, he and Churchill had been great mates because yeah. they've been on the same side uh, during the during yeah. the, 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 he's a, the he's a fascinating War. fascinating character actually. and 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 Matt and, and he was and and Churchill was under pressure to uh, uh, begging um, the Finns begging um, begging him not to do a deal with 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 Hitler because yeah. I and then and then the threat of invasion which was always a theoretical threat threat because we didn't have the resources or power to invade Finland on the uh, on the Soviet side mm. or or anti. Yeah. As, as an anti-Nazi struggle. Let Sorry. Me, let me jump. Let me jump in. Next the, one, ben. the questions aren't getting any fewer at the moment. So, <laughs> <laughs> was it? Was it? Um, this is from Christopher Evans. Was it easy getting the information from Russia, um, or had uh, had they released the information, giving you the idea to write the account of Operation Barbarossa? It, I mean, how easy is it? I mean, I know that the Russians are not particularly forthcoming, forthcoming with stuff. So. In the nineties, the archives were opened up very extensively and a great many brilliant academic historians swooped some of them were, were russian historians um, and they swooped and delved through the archives and got a huge amount of material some of which has been published large part of which has been published into english some of it uh, a lot of it hasn't hasn't been um, and so i drew on public for, for the russian side of it i drew on documents that had already been published and books that had already been written secondary sources but there are still quite a lot of that isn't there, which is what I, I wanted to, because I'd had, I I wanted to try and get a sense of how the, what it was like for Soviet soldiers. Now they were much more touched on what we were talking about before. The, the, the German soldiers could write letters home. They were censored, of course, but they could write letters home. They could describe without naming places what, what it was like, how they were feeling. Um, Soviet soldiers, Russian soldiers didn't dare do that. They were censored out of existence. So there were very, very few uh, letters of a memoirs of a certain kind, not terribly illuminating, and and there were and there were diaries, a few diaries kept, and and some letters that, that emerged. That I that the the the, the, the memoir, the, the, the book that I said that I said for was a was a was a was interviews that were done with Russians after after the war. Uh, sorry, after the opening up, but the 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 uh, I I did get through a. Um, a wonderful researcher, is herself a very good historian, um, writer of, of about women in, in the war, uh, and Liuba was uh, unearthed for me unpublished letters that had been collected in unpublished uh, diaries, which I found both in compelling and in and in the case of the letters extraordinarily touching, because here were people writing letters, all the letters. Every single one that I used, and they were actually of the ones she collected, were, and this is not surprising, they died at some point having written the letters home to their beloved ones, saying, now that now is the time to sell the potatoes. Have you remembered to sell the potatoes? Get a good price in the market. If not, that sort of that sort of letter from people saying it and saying it, it may be some time before I'm home. I'm not sure whether I'll get back. You know, powerful stuff. Right, we've got um, a question from, in fact, it was Stuart and Chris both asked a question, uh, which it's, it's a similar thing. How, how much did the oil in the Caucasus uh, play in the part uh, in Hitler's decision to invade? And Stuart asked, to what extent did Czechoslovak weaponry and armaments play a part in, in Barbarossa? So it's a, uh, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. In everyone's uh, mind. You no, know, these, these they are they're important things because they, they, they show a critical understanding of what war is about. Um, the, 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 in terms of the oil, the, 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 Germany had no oil of its own. It had synthetic oil. So it depended, it wanted to get the Baku oil wells. The, the, the huge uh, uh, um, Caucasian oil wells at Baku. Um, and uh, that was one of the big objectives. And of course, therefore, it was a Soviet objective to deny them those wells, as it was a British uh, objective to deny them the, the wells. And, and, and they, they, they never got them. In the end, they never got them. Yeah. Um, and shortage of oil, shortage of raw materials generally was Germany's problem, because they forget there was a there was a, um, a blockade of Germany. They depended very much on, on iron ore from Sweden, um, which the British were very effective uh, at trying to block. I say very effective, relatively effective. Um, the, on, the, on the weaponry, 
it's 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 intriguing. I'm I'm about as far from being a weapon specialist as you might be. I got into terrible trouble for describing a warship uh, having 14 guns when it only had 12. Uh, 12 inch guns rather than 14 inch guns and i've been so meticulous and i had wonderful uh, academic specialists in weaponry who, who read read that this is the last book checked it and i um, anyway i've done this we've done the same thing this time so you don't want to make unnecessary mistakes that get up people's noses if they know about them but you can't know everything the, the key thing is in the weaponry is that by the time you get to late 19 middle the, the, autumn of 1941 suddenly the, the T-34 Soviet tank makes an appearance and it terrifies the Germans. It, it, it alarmed even Hans Guderian, who was the, he was the Rommel of the Eastern Front. And actually in, in German terms, as regarded as uh, at the time, he was celebrated star. He was, you know, uh, Goebbels promoted him all the time in the media and he was a very forceful character. And he was bitterly complaining and demanding that, that, that his tanks should be strengthened, that he needed better guns to resist the T-34 firepower. And the teeth, he described uh, the, the panzers going in and when his, he had the, the, it was the second panzer division became the second panzer army, he, he describes them going in and the, and, the, and, the, and the shots peppering off the hull of the, of the tanks and the, uh, of the T-34. It's the only way to get, to destroy a T-34 was to go around the back of it, can you imagine? And then to drop fire into the turret so that you then exploded it inside it's a very small area so they were genuinely frightened of that the weaponry uh, uh, the german weaponry was much less uh, uh, resilient to weather the, a lot of the russian rep weaponry was cruder but it was designed for very rough territory and very harsh weather germans wasn't it's was much more sophisticated too sophisticated so often that that their, their their guns wouldn't fire the, in the in the wet cold weather um, the in the cold weather particularly they couldn't get the tanks started and then we touched on this earlier they were running out of of supplies during this period of manpower supplies weaponry so weaponry was fundamental of course in this but it, it was it was written in the runes if you like because you know, when you look at the, when when economic historians and, and historians look very closely at the weaponry, they, you, and you, you've got the statistics all out there, the increase in Soviet weaponry, and even when Speer came in in 1942 and did amazing things, um, still the output was slipping behind the output of the Soviet weaponry. It closed, but it was still slipping behind. And then, of course, by that point, in any case, um, the... Uh, the, the arsenal of democracy was producing very large quantities of weapons from the United States. Can I, can I just come in on two things there, if I may just butt in? Uh, there's a wonderful statistic that I often quote when you talk about these sort of production figures and so on, particularly with tanks. Um, the, the German tank that they produced the most of during the war was the Panther. Uh, and they produced about 6,000 Panthers during World War II. Now, bear in mind, and that was produced as a response to, as, as uh, Jonathan just said, as a response to the T-34, which terrified them in 1941. So they, they rushed out the Panther. Um, 6,000 of those are produced through the war. Bear in mind that the Soviets at the peak are producing 6,000 T-34s per month. Exactly. And True. then you can see the scale of the problem. Yeah. It's a mammoth. That's such a good statistic. It, yeah. it, it, it says it's, it's it in one. Actually. Yeah, it's mind-boggling. And the I other might, thing about, I might remember, I might remember that. Yeah, statistic. Yeah. Um, the other point is about the oil. Um, about the Germans going in for looking for, you know, um, Caucasus oil. Um, it's a little bit in the German mind. It's like a sort of. It's like a mirage. It's a sort of a chimera that they're, they're chasing the oil. A big part of the Nazi Soviet pact is the Germans wanting to get self self-sufficient particularly for oil but also for grain and yeah. they want to get that from the soviets but the problem is that stalin basically keeps turning off the tap so through that two-year period where they're effectively an allied stalin keeps turning off the tap he uses it you know in the same way as putin does with with um, um natural gas now you know you just turn off the tap it's a wonderful wonderful sort of political sort of pressurizer so at any, any complaint in the negotiations, he'd turn off the tap and stop the oil, oil, oil supplies. And as a result, during that period, the Germans get more oil from Romania than they do from the Soviet Union, which is a for, forgotten fact. Yeah. So what, what part of Hitler's logic in going in is to say, you know, I can't milk this, this hateful edifice of the Soviet Union. I can't milk it for my own purposes. So I've got to take it. So he was going after something that he knew was there, but he wasn't getting enough of it 
you know, through the through the, the previous methods. Yeah. We are we are gonna run over a little. I hope everyone's all right. Sorry. Um, are you okay, Jonathan? With yeah, I'm okay. A slight over. Um I just got so many questions. Um, Margaret Baxter, did Germany turning against its former partner take Churchill by surprise? How did this affect um, British war strategy? Um, well, Chir Churchill, uh, it, it, it didn't, it didn't. The, the, British, the British intelligence services, um, um, they were, everyone was shocked by, by Molotov-Ribbentrop, you know, because they hadn't, they hadn't actually remembered Rapallo. As I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had they known Rapallo onwards, it wouldn't have been quite such a, a shock. These two beer moths of, of the of the continent. But uh, when Barbarossa happened, the in, until very late in the day, and Churchill picked up on this. Uh, it was about March, um, but he was so bleak. It started to try to warn Stalin that an invasion was coming. Problem was that Stalin being paranoid in any case, and having good reason for supposing that the, that the, that the British would be very pleased to see the Soviets and the Germans fighting, because that would weaken uh, the, the, the Nazi threat to Britain. Um, uh, Stalin refused to read the evidence. I mean, he, the, uh, forgive the language, you know, it, uh, the best informed evidence came from, um, from two sources, one, one from, uh, from Berlin and, and one from Tokyo. And, and, and whenever this evidence came in, he said, this is a son of a whore, have him ex you know, mad stuff, completely barking stuff. He wouldn't accept it, couldn't bear to contemplate the thought that, that because his armies weren't ready and he didn't want to fight at that point, um, delay, delay, delay if possible. So um, the, 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 the impact on Churchill when it happened, and this was very widespread, was, um, well, this is better than what might have been. Hmm. And Churchill uh, immediately on the day when he was woken with the news in the early morning, he settled down and he wrote himself um, a, a BBC broadcast which went out, which was him at his best, not overly grandiose, but with detail. I think of the peasant tilling his field and the jackboots. It was very powerful stuff. And he and a few days later, Roosevelt, in a, in a slightly uh, less overt way, made it clear that they would come to the Soviet Union's aid. They, as I said, British saw it as a means of keeping the Soviets in the war. The urge was to keep the Soviets in the war, keep them fighting. The more they broke down the German army, so, so much the better. Mm -hmm. The tension then arose between Stalin and Churchill, and to a degree between uh, Churchill and, and Washington, but principally Stalin and Churchill, because they were competing for the same armaments from, from, from the United States. Churchill needed them to defend Britain and also to defend the territories in the Middle East, the empire. And incidentally, no one during that period sort of said, oh, the British empire, well, I say no one, certainly not the coalition British government. They all kind of, the empire was the empire. That's, that was ours, that's what we did. We were fighting for the empire. So he, he needed, he was short of resources. He needed everything he could get from, you know, so he made lip service to supporting and then fought every inch of the way. I'm exaggerating to make the point slightly because he did give some goods, but nothing on the scale that Roosevelt did. Roosevelt had a, was much more uh, susceptible to, uh, to Stalin and more ready to believe that Stalin was a was a was a someone with whom uh, I could do business mm -hmm. to coin uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, phrase. Mm -hmm. um, Churchill um, had during the wilderness years had always said we have to have a relationship with the Soviet Union, and he was a great anti-communist. Incidentally, we've got to have a relationship with the Soviet Union. He saw unambiguously. This is what, one of the reasons why he was a great war leader and a much better strategic thinker than some of his critics. I think claim. He saw that, um, that from Britain's point of view, the real enemy was the Nazis, as he called them. Mm. Wow. Um, I'm going to one more question, if that's all right. I hope everyone's all right with, uh, with that. It was, um, it was actually the first question I received over email to Ben Edwards, which is a touch of um, modern day 
kind of uh, element to it, which I, I rather like. The most powerful men in Europe, European football, have reluctantly admitted to making errors in judgment and strength. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love the link here. Um, I don't it's, wish to. This could be regarded as stretching it, but I'm ready to go there. <laughs> uh, uh, this next line made me laugh so much. I don't wish to draw parallels between football club owners and Joseph Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> but it did make me wonder if Stalin ever admitted that he got something wrong, perhaps not publicly, but privately. <laughs> that's Ben Edwards. He's to blame for that. Ben, that's a, that's a very, it's a very entertaining question. <laughs> um, it, it is rather wonderful. I'm not a great follower of football, but it is rather wonderful to see, is it the owner of, of, of Liverpool, who, 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 is, who, who, who humbly apologised to the fans? Yeah thinking about them for the first time in his life <laughs> because he saw the writing on the wall. Um, Stalin, Stalin, you always sometimes wish politicians would use the same uh, absolute humiliating, I got it wrong, as, as that guy did. He got brownie points for that, I think. Mm. But the, um, the, the, I do not he never admitted that it, Stalin it. admitted that he got anything wrong. Can Roger, can you think of Stalin ever doing that? No, I don't. I was thinking about this earlier on. And I mean, part of the problem, particularly with I mean, the, what he would presumably have to apologise for is is the ca catastrophe in summer of 41. But then also, I suppose, the, the relationship with Hitler as well, and the Nazi Soviet pact. And that was that was Stalin's signature policy. Yeah. So for him yeah. to sort of disavow that was to show weakness in the bear pit of Soviet politics. Well, and, and you don't do that. But he was also very cunning and very smart. He could have come up with what one might call in modern terms a colourable case yeah. for doing the pact, even though it was... Of course, yeah. Cut. So, uh, no, so I, 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 I don't recall him ever ever expressing any regrets or, or apologies for anything. No. I don't think so. Not even for the losses, loss of unnecessary loss of life, no. which is on a huge scale, because he, he, he fought battles should never have been fought. Yeah. Can I... Um... It's been an absolute honour. Can I apologise to everyone who's asked questions? Stephen, you've had some, that's a lovely question. Unfortunately, it came at three minutes to eight. Um, Scott Jackson, Chris, Beth, um, which I think is actually Mark. No, I asked that question. Martin, um, uh, Dan, Mark, all of you. But apologies. Thank you to Jonathan. Thank you to Roger. Um, this is um, Jonathan's wonderful book. And dare I say it, this has come up in conversation. Uh, this is Roger's wonderful book. I did put the link to buying that. Um, I know that um, this whole story of the Devil's Alliance is something the Russians are def desperately keen to keep quiet in modern day the world. Yeah. And uh, to, a, to an extent where Roger received uh, a certain veiled threat from a certain... Um, uh, ambassador for America, Russian ambassador to America, um, which which to me is, is, is astonishing. A, a few days after that, I, re I received a visit in the bookshop from a um, uh, a, a Russian, uh, well, Russian accented person looking through the a history. tourist, a, to a tourist <laughs> <laughs> looking with, for the cathedral. I very quickly yeah. texted Roger, Roger to say uh, you may want to check your door handles. <laughs> But to, to which I think your wife was slightly more perturbed than you were. Like. Yeah, yeah, she was. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. My, my, my pleasure. I'm sorry to have banged on so we couldn't get more questions in. Oh, gosh. I mean, thing is, the thing is, uh, uh, an evening with you, uh, we should do these events from the pub. It feels, it feels <laughs> like the right sort of thing. And we'll just record them from a couple of angles. And, uh, yeah, very good. Honor, but, uh, so, Wonderful. but thank you, Jonathan. Next time you've got a book out, would we'll please do come to Tring and um, uh, yeah, we'd, our book festivals in November. Maybe we can do it physically next time. It would be I, if we can't. It, it, it would be rather depressing if it's for the reason that we can't do it at the moment because it's not yeah. coming out till uh, twenty twenty four. Yeah, yes. Oh, that would be depressing. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> All the other reasons, yeah, the ones which are out. sort of, you know, in, in the lap of the gods. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Roger, you've got a book out next year, is that right? Uh, hopefully end of next year, yes. May maybe into the year after, but yeah, so. The yeah. topic of which is? Is on the Holocaust, is on the passport operation during the Holocaust. And just in, in passing, uh, uh, Roger, we didn't talk about, no reason why, because we didn't have time, but the 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 if I've got a, a moment to say that I spent quite a lot of time dealing with the Einsatzgruppen, who were the Himmler's SS squads, mm -hmm. who followed up, swept up behind 
the the the, the advancing Wehrmacht. Yeah. And with the collaboration of the Wehrmacht command and sometimes the participation, they killed and killed and killed again, principally towards the end, Jews, men, women and children in the most unspeakable ways. By the end of December 1941, a million, first million of the five plus million Jews who were killed mm. were slaughtered on the Eastern Front and put into and the large part put into into pits, mm. having been treated with uh, so abominably. We mostly shouldn't speak about it now, but um, at this very moment, that's not a note on which to end my contribution. But I just think it's, it's so important to remember that the Holocaust started in 1941. Didn't yes, absolutely. Auschwitz. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Good. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Roger. Thank you to everyone who joined us. And um, we've got more events to come. I certainly know history wise, I've, I've got a uh, I'll be having doing a chat with um, with John Nickel um, to do with Tornado, which is his follow up to Lancaster and Spitfire. Um, that'll be in June at some point. Not not date, not date, date not sorted yet, but uh, um, there'll be many more to come. But uh, thank you again and uh, have a great evening. <laughs>